Hello and welcome back to our second episode of The Scoop, recorded live in the studios at Sadabac College here in beautiful Mission Viejo. I am your host, Evan Anderson, and today we've got quite an exciting show for you. To start, our news team will update us on some recent Saddleback College news, and then Courtney Miller will have the honor to interview an experienced actress who is a professor here on our very own campus. Later, we will learn massage techniques from professional massage therapists, and finally, We'll wrap up the show with the story of some local Orange County girls making the world a little brighter with a needle and a thread. Now, with a campus as big as ours, there's always things going on. And here at The Scoop, we're dedicated to keeping our viewers in the Scoop loop for the most recent and relevant news happening here on campus. So, let's take a look at this week's top stories given to us by our news desks. The Reagans were longtime friends of Saddleback, dating back to 1968, the opening of our campus. This was a relationship that lasted for the course of their lives. I'm proud to say that since that time, Saddleback College has distinguished itself as an outstanding educational institution with first-rate instruction and state-of-the-art facilities. To the faculty, staff, and students of Saddleback College, my congratulations on 25 years of excellence. This past week, at the age of 94, Nancy Reagan passed away of congestive heart failure. Saddleback College's flags will be set at half staff in honor of her life and her relationship with our campus. She set the standard in the causes and organizations she dedicated herself to. Her famous statement, Just Say No, in response to the war on drugs started one of these causes. Her memory is sealed to our campus, with the Health Sciences Building dedicated to the Reagans and their everlasting relationship with Saddleback. Stay clear of patients. So clear, I'm clear, you're clear, everybody's clear. Now, shock delivered. This little box might just save your life. AEDs, also known as automatic electric defibrillators, deliver electric charges to pace the heart until ambulances arrive. According to the National Center for Early Defibrillation, if an AED is used within the first minute of an incident, the survival rate is 90%. Orange County firefighter and EMT instructor Duke Juarez demonstrated how to handle a heart attack using CPR in an AED. There's above that, right on the middle or the bottom half of your sternum. We don't even get that exact anymore. We just look for roughly the nipple line in the sternum. Everyone can find that, right? And with the heel of our hand, we're putting it right on that sternum. And we try to, with straight arms, see how I get a good one and a half to two inches of depression in his chest. You want to go at a rate of about 100 a minute. Push the on button, it should tell me everything I need to do. So even... Plug in training no pads connector. Anyone the individual using the, the machine is guided by audio prompts provided by the AD, meaning anyone can use it. Okay. Training. From gray plastic case. Attach pads to bare skin exactly as shown. So there are pictures on each pad that tell you where it goes. Remove clothes from patient's chest. And then I try to roll it on to get all the air out so there's no little air pockets in there because electricity is going to shoot in there. Clear? Everybody's clear? Analyzing heart rhythm. So it's electronically looking at the electrical uh, activity in the heart. Stay clear of patient. Can interrupt Shock that. advised. So it's Stay saying, clear of patient. It's Press the rhythm. flashing orange button. Clear? Everybody now. clear? Clear? Shock delivered. There is one AED in all major buildings around campus, totaling to 20 units altogether. Remember, calling 911 and immediately starting CPR is the best survival strategy. Thank you for the update. Our thoughts and prayers go out to the Reagan family. And thank you for educating us on how to use an AED in case of emergencies. I feel privileged that we have access to life-saving equipment here at Saddleback and honored to go to a school that is invested in safety. Another thing that all, all students should take pride in is our top-notch staff here at Saddleback. Many of our educators here have advanced experience and expertise, rivaling four-year colleges. Courtney is sitting down with Maria Mayan Zett, our phenomenal acting teacher with years of experience and awards under her belt. So with that, we're gonna go over to Courtney right now in studio. So Courtney, take it away. Thanks, Evan. Today we're in the studio with Maria Mayazat, one of the professors here at the school. Maria, thanks for coming in and joining us today. 
Thank you very much. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience as a teacher here with the uh, school as well as some of your professional experiences? Well, I teach the screen acting program here in the CTVR department, and it's a, my avocation, it's my passion. I, uh, students have such great talent mm -hmm. uh, and creativity, so it's wonderful to be a part of their training process and getting them ready for what is expected of them in the professional world. That sounds great. Tell us a little bit about your background. How'd you get started in the industry? I know you worked in film and TV, a little bit of stage. Kind of tell us a little bit of, about that. I started acting professionally when I was 15, starting at the Seattle Repertory Theater, and then I moved uh, to London, and I was working throughout England, Scotland, and Wales. I studied with teachers from the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts. Wow. Then I went to the San Diego Shakespeare Festival. Uh, agent saw me there, and I signed with the agent, and then started working in television and film and theater the whole time. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing, great background. Now, at what point in your acting career did you decide to become a teacher? That's a big transition there. Well, I made a vow to myself that, and to my parents, actually, okay. that if I was unemployed as an actor for more than three months, I would go back to school. And three months? Mm-hmm. I'd go back to school and reinvent myself, and that didn't happen until I was 40. Okay. So I went back to school, went, started taking classes here at Saddleback, transferred to UCI, and then got my MFA in acting and directing at Cal State Long Beach. Cal State Long Beach was just also known as an awesome school for film and teaching and what have you. So awesome, great. Now, what do you find to be the most rewarding part about teaching the craft of acting to your students? I think the most rewarding part is seeing their work and seeing the characters that they create. You know, as an actor, mm. you have to convey the human condition. Yes. You have to embody these characters that are supposed to move the audience or entertain the audience. And it's wonderful to see the young actors, the creativity that they bring to their characterizations. They create the psychology of a character. And to me, that's the most rewarding when I view it and I can see the character and not the actor. Mm. That's the best part. Wow. Yeah. And is there a difference between um, building a character or acting on the stage as opposed to in front of the television or you know, the screen? There's a big difference. It's what I call focal length of performance, distance of communication from where the lens is, the distance between the subject, the actor, mm. and the lens. So the performance, it's almost like you have to act in a box and you have to be zen-like, but you still have to have all that emotion and energy and subtext that you would have in a stage performance. Wow. But it has to be much more refined and laser-like. Now, focal length, you said, that's also the name of your book, right? Yes. Tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about the book and what exactly we can learn by reading the book. Well, uh, the thing that I love about the book is that it has a lot of links. So when I talk about Tony Barr, when I talk about Michael Caine, yes. there are YouTube links awesome. that you can uh, check out. So, But it really is a synthesis of 25 years of professional experience in front of the camera and 10 years behind the camera. Wow. Now, when students come to take your class, I mean, many times they're brand new. Mm -hmm. They haven't taken one acting class whatsoever. So what kind of things are they learning in class? What kind of exercises? What kind of things do you do to help get them to the next level? Well, they, we start off with improvisation and warming up also because your voice and your body, uh, the physicalization that you choose is part of the actor's palette, yes. you know, is the tools that we use. Yes. But improvisation, I think, is essential because it allows some freedom. And then we go into scenes and memorizing the scenes and breaking it down in terms of the arc of the emotion of the character from, you know, act one to act three. Yeah, so. amazing. Now, can anybody learn how to act? Absolutely. Anybody? Absolutely. You know why? Why? Because everybody is unique. Everyone brings their own sensibilities, their own persona two characters that they play. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think anybody can act. Now what advice would you give to somebody that wants to get into the acting industry? Well, definitely study. <laughs> study, uh, go to open calls, yes. uh, submit to agencies, mm -hmm. uh, participate, and you can participate, start off in community theater, student films, okay. and go from there. Wow. That sounds great. Great advice. Thank you so much for coming in today. We really, really appreciate the fact that you came in and shared your knowledge and your experience. People here at Saddleback are very lucky to have you. Thank you very much. Hey, Evan. Man, back to you. Thank you, Courtney. And thank you, Professor Mayan Zett, for painting us a picture of what it's like taking one of your acting classes. I personally might sign up for Acting 101 because of how fun it sounds. Now, let's take a quick break. We're going to get back to the studio and relax with a few massage techniques. So, 
grab some candles, dim the lights, and the scoop will be right back in just a little bit. Welcome back to The Scoop. I'm Andrea Moore, and today we're going to learn some very cool massage techniques from licensed massage therapist, Samantha Baker. Hello. Hi, Samantha. Hi, how are how you doing? I'm great. I am you. wonderful. So what are we going to be doing today? Um, we are going to be going over just basic massage techniques. Um, I know a lot of people at school have stress with finals and midterms and studying and everything. So this will be kind of something that you can do with your friends, with brother, sister, whatever, just kind of simple stuff. Awesome, cool. So where do we start? What's the first kind of way to get into this? We start by basically lubricating the area. You have some oil or massage cream. Okay. Um, the I'll basics hold this for you. Oh, thank you. Your um, the Swedish massage is the basis of all other types of massage. Okay. Um, and effleurage is kind of the starting stroke. So it's long gliding strokes. Effleurage. Usually, mm -hmm, okay. fancy words. <laughs> Um, usually just to get the oil or the massage cream around, like along the area that you're going to want to be massaging. Okay. Yes, yeah, so so you start with that. strokes down. Yeah, outwards. deep. More superficial than deep, just kind of on top of the skin. You can do okay. a little bit of deeper stuff, but it's usually just going to be right on top. Soft, okay. Mm -hmm. cool. Soft. Um, the next one would be petrissage. Another fancy word. Petrissage. Okay. Um, that, I think, basically... The definition is kneading, lifting. So that's gonna kind of be your, when you come up behind someone and massage their shoulders, that's okay. that generic stroke. So you just come and lift and knead like you're kind of kneading dough. Okay, right up that's the most yeah. basic. It's the most basic. It's the most kind of um, satisfi satisfying would be like right up here in the shoulders. Okay. Just kind of knead, knead, knead. Knead, yeah. okay. Yeah. Just like the massage chairs, they got that kneading like option. Mm -hmm. Oh, exactly, but this is better because it's human. It's actual hands. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> um, the third one would be friction. Friction. So that is basically... Easy word. Easy word, right? The only English word. Um, that's going to be you're going to go down a layer. So instead of effleurage where it's right on top of the skin, you're gonna melt through the skin and go more to the muscle. Okay. And that's more of a non-moving. You just kinda be manipulating just that muscle instead of going And that's long. when you apply the more pressure? Yeah, usually that's more pressure, that's more specific, more direct to that muscle, that's more of a deep tissue okay. um, practice where you're gonna actually target a specific area instead of just kind of Isolated. generically going. So it's like I mm -hmm. have a knot in my shoulder blade, mm -hmm. so that's when we're gonna do the friction. We're gonna specifically target a certain area. Okay. And then the most famous probably is tapotement. Um, that's rhythmic tapping for the most part. Tapotement. Um, tapotement, yes. Tapotment. So that is in the movies when you see someone come up and like like karate chopping okay. his back. You always go with the muscle fibers. You can do this on anybody. Okay. You don't want to like chop them in half. Not like kinda, that. Okay. Not like this. This is kind of like chopping that's, her up. That's what you see. Yeah, right? See, there's, there's an art to it. There's an art to it. Okay. You kind of just go down her back. So I thought, Andrea, the sense you've obviously been paying attention and that you could do a very good job. A little bit. Chopping, a little bit. I don't know. Will I Lacey let me? I think Lacey will. I'll be your massage Do I need holder. lotion or just? Um, you could probably just chop so away. So stay close. I would stay close and, sorry, my hands along the muscle fibers and don't whack her bits. Just a quick. Oh, it looks beautiful. Quick. That's probably. Oh, yeah. Lacey looks like she's loving it. <laughs> But you'll get better. With practice, you can all get better. And that, that's probably, that's basically all the Swedish massage techniques. So all four of those in, is what makes the Swedish, Swedish yeah, massage. Yeah, Swedish massage is basically, there's another technique, but that's, that's a little less used. So these are the four basic techniques of that. And Swedish massage is the basis of 
other types of massage. So these techniques would be used in a deep tissue massage, in NMT, which is more targeting specific muscles as well. Okay. Yeah. And so, <laughs> so we want to get our friends, maybe a significant other, mm -hmm. something like that, lay down and get the rubbing and teaching so we can get them to watch this episode. Exactly. And this is going to be your basic little guidelines. Okay. So the first one was? Effleurage. Effleurage. And that's so when that I'm going to be come long in gliding. and mm -hmm. glide in. Usually that's when you're going to put your like massage cream on and that's, get it all And that's over. when you're layering mm -hmm. and getting it good mm -hmm. to go. So effleurage. Effleurage out, folks. Effleurage. Yes. Okay, and then the Petrissage next one. Petrissage. Petrissage is. That's your kneading. So my kneading. So that's like, going to be more, yeah, like you can this. do it on the back but you would I do it a lot like right at those shoulders. shoulders. That's super nice just to kind of get those top shoulder muscles. Especially most as people, students too, mm -hmm. sitting in the chair. Most people feel pain computer, right up there. Writing. Yeah. yeah, okay. So it's petrissage. petrissage. Friction. Friction's the easy Friction's one. The Friction, easy one. okay. So that's just, I'm more mm -hmm. focused and I'm not moving, but it kind of like. You're not moving on the skin as much, but that's perfect. You like want to sink in. And just kind of and going. Go okay. right under there. Okay. And then the last one, which you are absolutely an expert at, karate chopping. I'm karate. I'm There's karate. multiple ways to do that. Karate chopping is not the only way, but Ooh, that is the most nice. fun and the most satisfying for her and for us because you just awesome. karate people. So how long have you been doing massage? Um, I've been doing massage about six months professionally. Wow. Um, I went to Maui for uh, 14 months. Maui? I got my license there, yes. Is, are yeah. they better than us Californians? Um, no. I mean, uh, somebody's got to go and somebody's got to do it. But it was beautiful. It was nice. It's more of like an energetic vibe about their massage program, less like clinical, although you do get all the awesome. educational stuff. So what's, yeah. what's your favorite technique? What do you think is the most useful for like a student, mm -hmm. things like that, that? My favorite one that would probably be just be the easiest uh -huh. would be the Petrissage. Petrissage? Because someone's going to tell you if it's too hard or too soft. It's super easy. You just kind of... You get to be specific without actually specifically going to certain muscles and possibly being a little too hard or a little t in the wrong spot. So it's a nice one where you can just generically go over the shoulder. Okay. And most people, these muscles right up here are prone to stress, stress more often yeah. than other things. Um, they have their own spinal nerve, so they okay. basically don't have as much of a filter to say, don't be stressed, don't kind of come up here. So you wanna, you know, sometimes it's hard, you gotta yeah. relax. But it's when people really walk hard. out, you're usually a little more relaxed. We hope so, we hope so. So that is probably my, my favorite, my, that's the easiest to grasp. That's a quick gist of everything we can, quick er, or those ones. Okay, awesome, well we're running out of time here, okay. so we're gonna get into our next commercial break, but thank you so much for coming yeah, in, and if people wanna schedule a massage or something, they can just check out your website and yeah. give you a call mm -hmm. and make it all scheduled out and you'll that go to them. That would be lovely. Yes, yeah, that would be Bring perfect. Bring the table, yeah. you go there. This table. Perfect. Awesome. Alrighty, well, we're going to go to our commercial break and I will see you uh, when we come back. Thank you so much and uh, The Scoop will be right back. Welcome back to The Scoop. I hope you enjoyed your time of relaxation. Next up, we have the Saddleback Showcase Spotlight, where we'll introduce to you some of Saddleback's talented filmmakers. This week, we'll take a look at a suspenseful short film created by two of Saddleback's students titled Distress. So with that, let's take a look. My name is Tim Tran, and I'm the director and uh, one of the writers for Distress. Hi, I'm Hiram Borges. I, uh, I was the cinematographer. 
my co-writer, Travis Nail, was the one who came up with the story because um, we wanted to do something that was somewhat out of the, the comfort zone for Salback Film. Why wasn't the gun loaded, Mike? You're not my sister. What difference would it make? You let her get me. After all the things I've done for you, all the times I had your back. You deserved it. That girl is dead because of you. I know, Michael. I hear her whispers in my skull. She wants you too. This was all you. We're in this mess because I looked up to you. I wanted to be like you and I let you control me. We normally do straight drama. So um, what was comfortable for us or what we wanted to experiment with was, uh, was a horror slash crime short. When Tim first introduced me to the script, I immediately thought, okay, this is going to be a challenge. There was no particular um, way that I could light it without having any kind of moonlight or anything like that. Most of the movie was lit just by sh blowing HMI through the windows and just kind of trying to make sure that the concept of moonlight just bled through the entire movie. Um, I felt that the lighting in the movie really gave uh, gave some of the spark in the movie as to how each character should feel and how each character should 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 um, should be in in the in the setting that they're presented with. For the ghost effects, uh, we mainly try to employ uh, camera tricks, have the ghost superimposed over it, so we can get the kind of glitching effect when she moves around. Here, let me try. What are you waiting for? Shoot her. Yes, uh, the, the whole creative process between Travis and I, uh, we basically both came up with somewhat of the, the skeleton of the story. And then what we did was we both wrote our own versions of the script. And as we, uh, we compared and bounced ideas back and forth, we kind of just melded them into a single story. So that's also kind of how it became like a hybridization of, of horror and uh, a crime story. I felt like it was a it was a satisfactory product for all the hard work we put into it, and it was a pretty valuable learning experience, especially being something that was quite out of our comfort zone, something that was pretty challenging. If you're like me and want to see distress in its entirety, it will be featured in a college showcase at the Newport Beach Film Festival held during the last week of April. To find out more about the film festival and the success of these, film, these films, visit NewportBeachFilmFest.com. While we're on the topic of success, our last story is about three young ladies who were moved into action and started up a brand new company in order to relieve some of the struggles of the poor. The company is called State of Wild, and it has taken off because of the compassion burning inside of these three young entrepreneurs. Let's take a look about what they're all about. Orange County locals come together for music, food, and fun at the launch of a new startup company called State of Wild. The company was started when Jerusalem Taylor decided to use her talent in sewing to help create products she could sell to help raise money for the School of Hope. State of Wild started actually almost a year ago. Um, the idea of it did. State of Wild sells handmade scarves, beanies, and other clothing in order to help support the School of Hope in Guatemala. She recruited her friends, Jessica Willis and Nicole Adan, who, although had no sewing training, wanted to learn to show their support. We just thought if we have some talent, and I didn't really know how to sew at first, and Juice was able to teach me as well as my mom, and um, that's how it came about. And Nikki jumped in, and we've been going ever since. I jumped on the bandwagon because I really loved the cause, and I loved, um, I don't know, the idea of doing something here to help people elsewhere. We are having our launch party and a fundraising event for the Hope School in Guatemala. That way they can be able to keep the school open, and it's for um, basically families or students 
um, kids who can't afford to go to school. The company gives 15% of its sales to help support the school. The money is used to help pay for teacher salary and food for the students. The school gives opportunities for Guatemalan youth to be successful and choose a life of contributing to society with their education instead of a life of crime to survive. One of the students was saying, I'm just going to be a thief like my dad, and because that's just what he thought, that's what his future was. But this school really gives them hope and education to be able to stop that cycle of poverty. For those interested, State of Wild has many items for sale on their website stateofwild.bigcartel.com. Feel free to visit their Facebook page at State of Wild. What does the future look like for this company? I think I see us helping a lot more people. Um, already we want to go into like, okay, making t-shirts and all the fun creative stuff. Um, but I even see collabing with some of the other um, charities and fundraisers. We want to come up with new stuff. We have uh, Sobros coming out, which is our men's line. Littles line for for boys and girls um, through headbands and beanies, um, shirts for another feature thing. We just want to be able to spread out the word of what we're about and be able to make a difference in our own special life. With over 600 children and young adults studying at the School of Hope, they are working to break the cycle of poverty through education, empowerment, and enterprise. You can show your support by supporting State of Wild. And there you have it. You don't have to have skills in order to help the poor. At first, all these girls had was determination and zeal. The skill came with practice. Thank you, State of Wild, for that reminder. Since temperatures are rising in Orange County, keep your eyes open for their new spring line coming out this week. And with that, it's time to wrap up this episode of The Scoop. I want to give a very special thank you to Maria Mayanzet and Samantha Baker for joining us in studio and sharing their wisdom. Congra congratulations to Tim and Haram for your short film making it into the Newport Film Festival. I'm your host, Evan Anderson, and I'll see you next week for another episode of The Scoop. Thank you so much for joining us today and tuning in. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you.